Welcome to disturbing curiosity. In a world where parents are expected to be protectors, some betray this sacred trust in the most horrifying ways. In this episode of Evil Parents, we take on three more harrowing stories of parents who committed unthinkable crimes against their own children. Join me as we explore these chilling tales of betrayal and horror, seeking to understand the why behind these heinous acts. Viewer discretion is advised. If this is the content you seek, consider subscribing to the channel, where there's new, unsettling content every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Let's begin. Submerged. Born September 26, 1971, Susan Smith had a troubled early life. Her father took his own life when she was six years old, and Smith herself attempted suicide at age 13. Her mother then married Beverly Russell, who later was revealed to have molested Smith when she was a teenager. After graduating from high school in 1989, Smith made a second attempt to kill herself after a married man she was in a relationship with ended their affair. She later married David Smith, and they had two sons. The relationship was rocky due to mutual allegations of infidelity, and they separated several times. In October 1994 in Union, South Carolina, Susan Smith, now a divorced mother of two young boys, contacted the local authorities in a panic claiming that she had been carjacked by a black man who drove away with her two young sons, Michael and Alex, age three and one still inside. This led to a massive manhunt and an extensive, highly publicized investigation. However, nine days later, Smith confessed to the crime. She had actually driven her car into John D. Long Lake, drowning her two children inside. Her motive was reportedly to clear the way for a relationship with a wealthy local man who had no interest in a ready-made family. In July 1995, Susan Smith was convicted of two counts of murder. During her trial, her defense team presented evidence of her troubled mental state, including a history of depression and suicide attempts, as well as a troubled personal life marked by the suicide of her father, molestation by a stepfather, and a series of broken relationships. At the conclusion of her trial in 1995, she was sentenced to life in prison, with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Her case remains a significant example of a high-profile criminal case involving filicide and sparked widespread media attention and public debate about issues such as mental health, motherhood, and race in the criminal justice system. Susan Smith will be eligible for parole in November 2024. Her case is an example of media manipulation, mental health crisis, and the inevitability of the truth. The Bodyguard Christopher Coleman, born in 1977, was the son of a televangelist preacher and by most accounts had a respectable upbringing. He would meet his wife, Sherry Weiss, at a K-9 training seminar at Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio in May 1997. They quickly began dating and soon after, Weiss became pregnant with their first child, Garrett, leading to their marriage. Their second son, Gavin, was born two years later. Through a family connection, Chris would land a job as the personal bodyguard for popular televangelist Joyce Meyer, earning a modest six-figure salary. The Colemans resided in a nice two-story home in Columbia, Illinois, not far from Chris's parents in Chester. Friends and neighbors saw them as a great couple, and along with Gavin and Garrett, a beautiful family. But on May 5, 2009, that would all come to a horrifying end. That morning, Coleman left his home and headed to a gym in South St. Louis County. He tried contacting Sherry by calling and texting her during his gym session and again on his way back home. Concerned, Chris reached out to the Columbia Police Department, asking them to check on Sherry and their boys. Columbia Police met Coleman at the his residence, where they found a basement window open. They entered through the basement, and while searching the house, discovered walls spray-painted with messages like, I am always watching, you have paid, and punished, in large red letters. Police discovered the bodies of Sherry, Garrett, and Gavin in their beds, all showing signs of strangulation with a cord or rope. After exiting the home, the officers informed Chris of his family's deaths and took him to Columbia Police Headquarters for questioning. Suspicion quickly fell on Chris due to digital evidence from Sherry's phone and his laptop, revealing marital issues and an affair with a woman named Tara Lintz. During interrogation, detectives discovered that Tara Lintz, the woman Chris Coleman was having an affair with, was actually Sherry's friend from St. Petersburg, Florida. While Chris acknowledged knowing Lintz, Florida officers were simultaneously questioning her about their relationship. Meanwhile, 
Coleman's family organized funerals for Sherry, Gavin, and Garrett on May 9th at Evergreen Cemetery in Chester. Sherry's family later arranged a visitation in a Chicago suburb, which Chris Coleman did not attend. The investigation would soon prove that it had all been an elaborate plan to rid himself of family to pursue a relationship with Lintz. Christ strangled his wife and their two kids in their beds with some sort of cable or rope. He then spray-painted throughout his home, staging the scene to make to support his story. Coleman was arrested and charged with the murders. In 2011, after 15 hours of deliberation over two days, the jury returned guilty verdicts on all counts on May 5, 2011, the two-year anniversary of the murders. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. The case attracted significant media attention due to its brutal nature, the infidelity with his wife's best friend, the involvement of a religious organization, and the calculated efforts of Coleman to mislead investigators and cover up his crimes. Carjacked Diane Downs, born August 7, 1955, appeared to be an ordinary woman to most who crossed paths with her. Her early life was troubled. She came from a strict conservative household. She married Steve Downs in 1973, not for love but to escape her family. They had two children, Christy Ann and Cheryl. When she became pregnant for a third time, she had an abortion, which Diane later regretted. She decided to have another child to compensate for her perceived mistake. Her husband had a vasectomy, so she turned to a friend, Mark Sager, to father her third child, Stephen Daniel, born in 1979 an infidelity that led to her first marriage ending in divorce. On May 19, 1983, Downs was launched into the media spotlight when she showed up at the hospital in Bloody Car. Herself and her three children had all been shot, the story she told. She reported that during a late-night drive home from a friend's house, she took a scenic route with her sleeping children. Around 10 p.m., she claimed to encounter a bushy-haired stranger on the road, flagging her down. She stopped to speak with him, and he demanded her car keys. When Downs refused, a physical struggle ensued, during which he shot her in the left arm and then opened fire on her three children in the car. Downs recounted that she feigned throwing her car keys into a bush, distracting the assailant. Seizing the opportunity, she jumped back into the car and drove to the nearest hospital for help. However, that story would hold no weight as forensic evidence contradicted Diane Downs' story. There was no blood spatter on the driver's side of the car nor any gunpowder residue on the driver's door or interior panel. She also didn't disclose to police that she owned a 22 caliber handgun, the same weapon used in the shootings. Investigators didn't find the murder weapon, but they discovered unfired casings in Downs' home with markings matching the murder weapon. Additionally, witnesses reported seeing her car moving towards the hospital at only 5 to 7 miles per hour, conflicting with her claim of driving there at high speed. This evidence, among others, led to Downs' arrest nine months after the shooting on February 28, 1984. She was charged with one count of murder and two counts each of attempted murder and criminal assault. Prosecutors argued that Diane Downs shot her children to free herself for an affair with her lover, who reportedly didn't want children. The case heavily relied on testimony from her surviving daughter, Christy, who recounted how Downs shot all three children at the roadside before shooting herself in the arm. On June 17, 1984, Downs was convicted on all charges and sentenced to life in prison plus 50 years, with a minimum of 25 years before parole eligibility. The sentence was intended to be served consecutively, with the judge indicating a desire for Downs never to be released. Initially incarcerated at the Oregon Women's Correctional Center in Salem. On July 11, 1987, she escaped by scaling an 18-foot razor wire fence and remained at large for 10 days, eluding a 14-state manhunt before being recaptured. She is now serving her life sentence in the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation with no chance for parole. We've reached the end of yet another unsettling journey through evil parents. These stories remind us of the darker side of human nature that exists even in the most sacred of relationships. Thank you for sacrificing some time to explore these tales with me. Please don't hesitate to share your thoughts in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and ring the bell so you don't miss any of the upcoming episodes. We have many more chilling tales to share in this series and our other series on this channel. 
with fresh uploads every Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. Stay safe, stay curious, and stay disturbed.